The Association of Consultants for Liturgical Space is a voluntary membership organization of professionals dedicated to the creation of beautiful worship spaces for faith communities. This webinar series is part of our commitment to providing ongoing mutual professional support and continue edu continuing education for our members. I'm Paul Barable of Growth Design Group. I am the f webinar facilitator for ACLS Communications Committee, and it's my pleasure to facilitate today's webinar. Today's speaker is Scott Rydell. Scott graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee School of Architecture and the Wisconsin Conservatory of Music. He is organist and choir master at Christ Church Episcopal in Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, and has taught the Science of Acoustics course at Columbia College in Chicago. Scott has consulted on the design and installation of hundreds of new rebuilt and relocated heritage pipe organs throughout the United States. He is published in the GIA Quarterly, the Diapason. Did I say that right, Scott? Yes, yes exactly. Cross Accent, the Association of Lutheran Church Musicians, and the Yale Institute of Sacred Music Review Magazines. He has presented lectures on acoustics and organs to the Association of Lutheran Church Musicians, the National Association of Pastoral Musicians, the American Guild of Organists, American Institute of Architects, and the Acoustical Society of America. Welcome back, Scott. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here with you today as we discuss uh, organ design for churches, especially uh, looking at functionally and technically and acoustically appropriate spaces and architectural uh, settings to accommodate an organ in a worship environment. I thought it might be worthwhile at the beginning just to consider why should a church have an organ? Um, across time and throughout history, it is really one of the best tonal resource instruments to accompany and lead and support and envelop the human voice as that human voice sings and participates in a liturgical worship service. Another advantage of an organ is one musician, a single player can control a great variety and scope of uh, musical color. Uh, there is a historic and continuing large body of compositions, literature and musical resources for playing the organ. It's a very high quality musical instrument with long, uh, excellent potential for longevity. I think the oldest organ we have surviving in the world today it was built in around the 1300s in Europe and over time it uh, becomes uh, one of the lowest cost options for uh, church music because of its great longevity. Here we see on the screen a large uh, a tracker action which is a mechanically actioned pipe organ in a basilica uh, but all organs do not have to be large Small instruments to accommodate a small chapel or worship environment also do an excellent job of leading a congregation in song and worship. So what is an organ? An organ is really consists of two primary sections or parts. One is the console. This is simply the control panel for the organist having keys, pedals um, to play the notes, various stop knobs to turn on or off ranks or sets of pipes, and each rank or set of pipes controls a different musical tone or color. So there can be a flute stop and a violin stop and an oboe stop, a trumpet stop. Um, don't really think of an organ as a one-man orchestra, but kind of it is. It gives one player the ability to play a variety of musical sounds and colors. Other control things on the console you see above the top keyboard, what we call couplers. That's, this allows the stops dedicated to one keyboard to be played on another keyboard. Under the keyboard, you see various round buttons. These are combination pistons that allow the organist to turn on and off many stops all at once. You see three pedals under the uh, lower keyboard down at the knee panel. Those are for volume control. Pushing the pedal up opens louvers or um, shades in the chamber to allow more sound out. Closing that pedal down will close those shades and quiet the sound. And then at the floor underneath the bench, you see uh, 
pedals, these are the same kind of notes as the keyboard, but play the lowest notes of the organ with the feet instead of the hands. This allows the organist with both hands and feet to be playing many, many notes at a time. So that's the control panel, the console of the organ. The sound producing portions of a pipe organ are the pipes, wind blown. So wind has to enter these pipes rather like wind uh, enters a flute or a clarinet or an oboe. And the design of the pipe, the shape, size, material uh, determines the tone color, uh, musical sound that this pipe is going to make, just like in the orchestra, how we have brass and woodwinds and wooden violins and cellos and so forth. So the size, shape, and material of a musical instrument impacts its tone and musical style. So in an organ, there needs to be many pipes. Uh, one pipe plays one pitch only. So typically a rank or set of pipes will have at least 61 pipes in that set. One pipe for every note or key on the keyboard. Organs have most often 61 note keyboards and 32 note pedal boards, unlike a piano, which has an 88 note keyboard. So 61 pipes per set and the, the different sets of pipes offer different musical variety and color of tone, just like an orchestra with many players has the potential for different color and variety of tone. So here are just some images of uh, ranks of organ pipes together in an instrument chamber. And here you see a, a man about to tune this organ, he needs to reach all the pipes to adjust the tuning sleeve or scroll or wire. Uh, but again, on this photo, you can see the variety of size and shape of pipes to get the different sounds desired. A taller or longer pipe plays low pitch, think tuba in the orchestra, and a short, a small pipe plays high pitch, think piccolo in the orchestra. To get these pipes to play, we need a mechanism, a set of valves to open and close to let wind to the pipe or to prohibit that wind from getting to the pipe. And those valves are enclosed in the wind chest. So in this photo, you see pipes up above the silver metal pipes. You see the racks that hold those pipes and the wind chest is below. This particular wind chest has a glass cover to it, which just aids in maintenance and technical adjustment of the organ so the organ can be played. Uh, and you can see into the glass if the valves are working properly. But there is a wind chest with the valves inside and pipes above. Also to allow an organ to play, we need some other support equipment. Here on the right side of the picture, you see a pipe organ electrical switching system. Now, this is different than an electronic or digital organ. This is just the switches that allow the correct pipe to play when the organist calls upon it. So the organist will draw a stop at the console, will press a key at the keyboard, and the switching system will get that electrical impulse to the right valve in the wind chest, open the valve, and allow the organ to play. Uh, also, some of the other technical support equipment of an organ is the winding system. The wind is created by an electric blower, typically. In the old days, it was a pumped bellows. Uh, that wind has to get directed to this article, which is a wind regulator, to account for amount and pressure of wind available to all the pipes. And here is a blower with a uh, static or uh, primary wind regulator attached to it. The blower is the green uh, motor and fan equipment off to the right on the photo. So all of this equipment needs to accom be accommodated somewhere within the architecture of a building for an organ to play. It takes a bit of space. <clears throat> the other option, of course, is a digital or electronic organ. This type of organ has no pipes but uh, produces tone through a set of speakers. The tone is often sourced by recording organ pipes and storing that recorded tone within the mechanism of a digital organ. And then the, when the organist plays, the tone is delivered through speakers. And digital electronic organ speakers will have different size and shape and type depending on the kind of tone they are to project. Here, for example, is a bass speaker, which would have uh, a larger unit because of the larger sound waves it's making. So 
that uh, constitutes essentially the uh, parts or equipment of a pipe organ or an electronic organ. We need to look at where should an organ go in a church. And um, first we want to see that the organ pipes or speaker tone, whichever it may be, is located and is sourced near the choir singers, the musicians of the church, the instrumentalists, singers, the organ, the organ console, all should be in rather close proximity to each other. So there is no time delay or uh, rhythmic uh, accuracy problem. The organ pipes or organ tone is best distributed from above and behind the choir singers, as you see in this picture. That allows the choir singers and the organ tone to be blended together and then delivered to listeners in the congregation as a well-developed and blended ensemble. Here we also we see the organ console nearby so the organist can see the choir singers and director and control the balance of sound. Within the room, it's best if organ pipes are located as near as they can be on the long axis of the building. Uh, if the pipes and the or speakers and the organ tone emanates from the end of a long axis of the building it has the most even uh, distribution without obstruction to all the worshipers in the space. So here the uh, organ pipes are at the end of the apse there on a revised cathedral, which now has the altar in the center, but it is on the long axis. Here we see some organ pipes in the balcony of a Catholic church, again on the long axis of the room. So once we have established a place for organ pipe sound and tone to emanate from, again, near to choir singers, um, we want to look at where should the console be. On this floor plan, you can note the indication of the console location, which is near the choir singers, immediately again forward and nearby to where the organ pipes are located, which is above the sacristies, as shown on this drawing, and near the grand piano, near the choir director, so that the musical ensemble works together and so the organist has good view of the entire room. That organist needs to know when a bride is ready to begin a wedding procession. That organist needs to see the altar to know when the priest is doing particular actions that the organist needs to provide musical response or accompaniment to. The organist needs to see where the casket is in procession at a funeral. The organist needs to see what's going on in the room, in the room to coordinate the musical accompaniment and leadership. So back to this picture where we again see the organ console near the organ pipes for good proximity and near the choir singers. Uh, some organs have what we call track or mechanical action. Uh, the previous picture had an, a pipe organ with electric action that allowed that console to be placed uh, anywhere needed in a tracker or mechanical action pipe organ the keyboards must be very near to the pipes this is a little bit limiting in terms of where to place the organist but the benefit of a tracker organ is the organist has more intimate control over the key action and the tone of the pipes so we see sometimes as you do in this picture up above the keyboards above the music rack a mirror so the organist has a better view of what's going on in the worship space. This is also a mechanical or tracker action pipe organ. This instrument has the console located about six feet or so forward of the pipe. So it is possible to give a little space between pipes and console with a mechanical or tracker action pipe organ. This allows a place for the choir singers in between and it's a very convenient setup. But about six feet is the maximum distance one would want to place a tracker or mechanical organ console from that organ's pipes. Well, once we have the organ and its console well placed in the room, we need to talk just for a moment about the room and its room acoustics. Um, the acoustics in a worship space, especially for a parish using organ or traditional type music, need to be fairly on the live side. This is especially to allow the congregation, the assembly, the worshipers in the assembly to hear each other well for good participation and support in the sung and spoken parts of the mass. But that 
generously reverberative building also allows good tonal enhancement for organ pipes and choir singers. So we do need a good acoustic environment for organs to help them do their maximum potential goodness in terms of providing music and leading worshipers in song. So a good acoustical space is important to a good sounding organ. So we're going to take a little look again at different types of organs. This is the console of a digital or electronic organ. Uh, sometimes I think people have the notion that a digital organ might be easier to play than a pipe organ. Not so. In fact, the entire intent and purpose of a digital organ is as much as possible that it replicate or simulate organ pipes with its tone and with its way of playing. So you see the same setup of stops, pedals, keys, pistons for stop changes as we showed on the pipe organ console a bit earlier. So there is a digital electronic organ. Uh, some organs can be combination or hybrid instruments. Here is just a photo taken inside the chamber of a hybrid instrument. So you see on the left, the large bass speaker cabinet. Right in the middle, there's sort of a gray, uh, another speaker cabinet. Then you see the wind regulator down below and some organ pipes at the right side of the picture. So this is a hybrid organ making tone from both speakers and pipes. And here would be an all pipe organ. And this again is an instrument of tracker or mechanical action. You see the organ console and player right immediately connected in the case to the pipes. And the whole organ is contained in casework. It's really sort of like a little band shell, as it were, that uh, contains the facade pipes. You see many more pipes inside. And uh, that constitutes this kind of mechanical action organ. The second way to run a, oh, sorry, before we do that, there's a picture inside of a tracker organ. So you see the actual linkage of trackers, rods, uh, roller bearings, and so forth. Another view of a similar setup of how the tracker mechanical action organ uh, really works. These rods, levers, trackers, and so forth connect direct from key to the pipe valve and the wind chest. And when you depress a key, you're intimately and directly pulling open that valve inside the wind chest. Now we're back to a electric action pipe organ. This is what's called electromagnetic action. You see the little gray articles with a, a U-shaped turn of metal at the top. That's the electromagnet. And next to that is the uh, pneumatic or leather valve. If I go to the next picture, you see the valve open. There, the valve's closed. When that valve opens up, it lets wind up the tube into the organ pipe, which is above at the top of the wind chest. So electro-pneumatic action or any electric action in a pipe organ makes an electrical connection to the valve that lets wind into the pipe. But that electrical connection allows the console to be put almost anywhere because all you need is a long enough cable to get it where you need it to be. Here is another view of a different kind of electric action pipe organ, but you can see the red wrapped electromagnet valves, uh, and those connect to the actual pipe valve inside the wind chest. When electricity enters one of those electromagnet valves, it pulls the pipe valve open and the pipe plays. So we have now considered where the console should be, where the organ should be in the church, uh, that there are different types of organs. The next really important question is how big an instrument is appropriate or needed for a church. And uh, this chart before you right now is prepared by the uh, Associated Pipe Organ Builders of America or APOBA. This is a handout that's available to you. And at the end of this talk, I'll have contact information if you would like to get the APOBA, the Associated Pipe Organ Builders of America design guide booklet, which contains this chart. This chart is just a, a beginning guide to allowing space and figuring out how much space should be allowed for a pipe organ in a church. 
you see down the left column, it references seating capacity. So if we just look at the very bottom of this chart, for example, in a church of a thousand seats, the recommendation that there be somewhere between 65 and 86 ranks or sets of pipes in the instrument. The recommendation is that this would be appropriate place for a four keyboard or four manual organ. And um, then the next column gives you about how many square feet of space in the building should be allowed per rank or set of pipes. It recommends how much height should be available for an organ space. And then you see the same thing for horizontal layout. So this is a handy chart for at least establishing in your design um, preparations how much space might be appropriate to dedicate for a pipe organ in a worship space. Again, this chart's available to you and the contact information's coming later. Now, this space is very well used. Um, I've just got a series of photos here of pipe organ chambers and you can see that there's not much extraneous space. Every inch gets used uh, to place pipes and wind chests and wind regulators and electrical switching systems and you need room for a person to walk around inside to get to these pipes for any maintenance that might be needed or for tuning. It's very important that a pipe organ space be dedicated to the organ. No fire sprinkler pipes going through the middle of the room, no air conditioning ducts um, passing down the way. The room should be dedicated to the organ and nothing else because there's a lot of organ stuff to get put in there. more views of pipe organ chambers and spaces. So when an organ builder says they need thus and such space for an instrument, they mean it. <laughs> um, here are now some examples of um, different organ designs that might be helpful to you as you consider how to place and aesthetically uh, consider an instrument in a church. This picture is of a mechanical or tracker action instrument and it's self-contained in its own case, rather like its own band shell. Um, a little close-up view. So this entire organ is contained in this one wooden cabinet. All mechanisms, bellows, blowers, trackers, it's all in there. And that is a good way to go. Um, especially if you, have, if you have room in the building for this kind of floor space dedication. Off to the right here, there's another encased uh, single unit tracker action pipe organ. Uh, other than tracker action, once we have electricity in the organs action, we have a little more freedom of where to place things in the room. Um, in this cathedral building, there are two twin organ chambers on either side of the sanctuary up on the second level. And the pipes you see are just the front or facade pipes. There are uh, larger spaces and chamber rooms behind these facade pipes that contain the rest of the instrument. There's a lot of freedom in terms of visual design of how the facade pipes are presented. Um, but it's often good to do a facade pipe front on a chamber which contains the rest of the pipes because those facade pipes themselves are resonating um, bodies and they do help in the projection and blending of organ tone. A little close-up view. So we have a, a facade fronted organ pipe chamber. Here's another more contemporary example of the similar concept, a facade or front of organ pipes in a very interesting and modern array, uh, covering a chamber which is full of the rest of the organ equipment behind. The choir singers sit immediately in front of this organ pipe facade, and you can see some sound diffusers on the wall beneath the pipes to help all the musical sound blend. This is a thousand seat Catholic church and it does have an organ of about 65 ranks or sets of pipes in it. And so that's a good visual representation of what that takes spatially in a room. Just a close up of the facade. Uh, a little more unique visual array, but uh, it's a good thing that as time goes on, creative design keeps coming along. 
here is a, a church with an electronic or digital organ, and you see the two gray angled um, covers in the soffit of this building just below the ceilings to the right and left. Those are uh, sound transparent acoustical fabric with digital or electronic organ speakers behind them. So that's one way to treat uh, and locate digital organ speakers is behind the acoustic uh, grill or fabric. So they're uh, brought out of direct view. Uh, in this example, you see the large circle behind the front cross. That large circle is actually some acoustical transparent fabric. And the main body of digital organ speakers are behind that acoustical grill fabric circle. But in the same building, there are also electronic organ speakers distributed throughout the room. So what you're seeing up at the ceiling is some of the room's sound system for speech reinforcement speakers and some electronic or digital organ speakers spread throughout the space. Different organ companies uh, that make digital or electronic instruments will either have a protocol for keeping speakers together in a chamber or distributing them throughout the room. It just depends on what kind of digital organ a company provides. This church has a pipe organ in chambers in the front. So flanking the uh, center window, you see the two uh, brown or beige uh, sets of acoustical grill cloth fabric and the organ pipes are in the chambers behind. So in, in this particular installation, the architect desired not to see organ pipes. So an acoustically uh, transparent fabric was used to cover the chambers containing pipes. This happens to be also an historic organ. This is about a 90 year old pipe organ moved from its original church that closed into this building. So having it uh, in a chamber was actually a good idea because uh, it was always a chambered instrument. Another concept is to show pipes in sort of a creative uh, visual array instead of facades, just actually seeing the pipes. We often call this a pipes in the garden concept where pipes are sort of free form in their visual style and uh, height distribution in the room. So another creative way to place organ pipes in the space. Here again, we see organ pipes facading a case at the back of the room. And we have organ pipes in chambers with a facade across the chamber tone openings at the front of a room. Here is a large uh, church, uh, just like the previous example that had pipes both in the front and the back. This even larger building has pipes in the front and the back of the, the worship space. This is especially because for smaller masses where there's a smaller attendance where the worshipers sit up near the front, the uh, front instrument is used for the leading of uh, music in the mass right near the clergy. But when the building is, um, oh, here's a front view again, of, uh, organ cases containing more pipes than the ones you see on the facade. But when the building is uh, full and uh, with large attendance, then the uh, organ in the back, which really projects down the full length of the nave is used at this parish. So we have a floor plan design here now, getting into the uh, idea of looking at where an organ chamber might be located in a church. You see off to the left, the indication of where the console is, and that's in front of the choir singers on their risers. And then off to the left, see the indication, the arrows pointing to the pipe organ chambers. So these two chambers are flanking the altar space at the front of the room. And one chamber is particularly close to the choir singers to help in their accompaniment. There's a front section view and uh, the uh, note and arrows indicate where the tone openings are uh, so that the pipes within these chambers can be heard in the church. In this particular case, the tone opening is covered with an acoustically transparent grill cloth. There are no facade pipes here. And there is a photo of this design at work. In this example, um, we see again the organ console 
near the choir singers and the piano and all the other musicians. The organ pipe chambers are above the sacristies and storage spaces on the second level. So here's the second level floor plan now showing the organ pipe chambers and the tone opening grills. Um, and there is every option like the previous example to have uh, not seen the organ pipes and just have an acoustical fabric or a wood or metal lattice that is sound transparent to cover the organ chamber tone opening or one could use facade organ pipes on the front and if one does that has facade pipes those are typically and most often be actual playing organ pipes not fakes or dummies so there's a front view of this example Again, you see the organ pipe chambers on the second level above the first floor sacristies and storage rooms. And we have shown organ facade pipes in this example. Another uh, modern Catholic church worship space. You see up at the top of this drawing at the far right, there's indicated a storage room. Right next to that is three rows of choir singers on tiered risers. Above the storage room is the chamber to contain this church's digital organ speakers. You also see the console on this floor plan just ahead of the uh, choir singers chairs. So here's a close up view of that uh, second floor level above the storage space, digital organ speaker chamber. And the boxes you see there are the speakers uh, laid out and the chamber space is designed with an angled wall to help project that tone from the chamber into the room. Here in this drawing, we see the tone opening grill, and this is uh, shown as uh, just a transparent wooden lattice um, kind of grill for visual closure. What this church actually did at the end was they had some pipes from their old building, uh, from their old organ, uh, they, they bought a new digital organ, but they used some of the pipes and put those as facades in front of the digital speaker chamber. One more example. Again, on the upper left of this drawing, you see the choir music space, the organ console near the choir singers, grand piano, space for all the musicians together. And the organ chambers are placed above the sacristy and storage rooms at the top of this drawing, the front of the room. Here again is a floor plan of the second floor level, the organ pipe chamber area. And you see also indication of the tone openings, which again can be wood lattice, metal lattice, acoustical transparent fabric, or could be facade pipe. And there is a front view of the architect's design. Here again, they elected to use a wooden lattice as the tone opening cover. There's a drawing through the middle of the uh, organ chamber so that you can see how the, the ceiling height is generous. It's a little lower at one side and higher as the ceiling rises, but that works because organ pipes themselves are short and long. And here's the architect's rendering in the front of that room. And again, you can see the uh, tone opening grill with its wood slat uh, type lattice tone opening. And finally, another photo of a Catholic church with the uh, pipe organ on the long axis of the room, right above and behind the choir singers and the other instruments. The uh, altar and sanctuary areas off to the right. So this this again gives us a good example to just uh, recall some of the principles of having an organ well placed and designed in a church. The musicians, the organ, the choir singers, everybody is together on the long axis of the room. Adequate space is dedicated to the organ. With no other technologies or building parts going through the organ chamber. Uh, it's an acoustically appropriate space without carpet, but a fairly live room to allow for good participation by the assembly. There are many, many creative uh, visual opportunities for design here. And um, I hope these um, photos have given you some ideas. The next slide now is just the um, 
contact information for the APOBA, the Associated Pipe Organ Builders of America organization. Uh, you can write to them and or call and get their uh, organ design guide document, which does contain that chart about organ rank and size and space in a room. The other indication here is the American Institute of Organ Builders, the AIO. This is a more technically minded organization and uh, you can get from them information on things like organ temperature and climate and humidity and other technical aspects of uh, organ needs. Thank you much, Scott, for a uh, very informative presentation. We'll now open the webinar up to questions uh, from our listening audience. And um, I'd like to start by reminding you that if you have questions, you can use the box for any questions that you might have. We'll be able to see those and, um, and uh, respond to them. You can also use the raise hand feature if you wish to make a comment or a follow-up question. We do have a question from Paul Matic um, asking, uh, if Scott foresees any time when uh, digital can fully and faithfully replicate the acoustics or the sound of traditional pipe organs? Oh, now there's a good question. <laughs> um, to tell you the truth, I can't really foresee that. It's because of the physics and uh, nature of sound behavior. What makes a pipe organ sound like it does is that each pipe produces a separate, unique sound. You need one pipe per note of all the different sounds in the organ. And a digital organ will compress that delivery of sound into uh, fewer speakers. If a digital electronic organ had one speaker for every sound, like a pipe organ has one pipe for every sound, I think that um, that tone could be quite faithfully delivered. Uh, but because digital organs have less speakers than individual sounds, which means more than one kind of sound gets delivered by a particular speaker and multiple sounds get delivered by a speaker, you just can't achieve that full realism and the effects of space and airflow that a, a pipe organ really has. You know, when, when two musical instruments, two violins, two flutes, two oboes, two cellos, two organ pipes, make their sound, produce a sound wave, those two waves are heard in air and that those two waves combine to make a new third wave. That's part of the acoustic science that makes musical sound interesting and full and robust for us, but it's that combined two tones making a third tone that gives realism and gives organ pipes their distinct sound. And that happens over and over again because you hardly play ever two pipes at once. You play a whole handful, two hands, two feet. So you have many independent sounds combining and creating new waves all together for a vibrant real sound. And I just think digitally that can't really happen unless you have one speaker for every tone and then you're back to what a pipe organ is, one tone maker for every tone and you're back to the high cost. So there you are. I hope I answered adequately. Great, Scott. I had another uh, question just knowing that we have uh, uh, both design professionals, artists, and uh, also liturgical consultants that often set the aesthetic of worship space or help set the aesthetic of worship spaces. How, how involved or how much design input and, and sharing of design information does a um, organist or organ builder typically have um, with the with the liturgical consultant or with the architect or artists that are involved in the process well i think it's critical that they have a lot <laughs> of excellent uh, design coordination together because 
the organ plus all the other aspects of the liturgy and the architecture need to work together in the same room. Um, it all starts really though with how big is the instrument going to be, how many ranks of pipes or how many speakers, just physically what do you need to accommodate in the space. Once that's figured out and you have adequate space dedicated, I think you turn next to the aesthetic of it, the, the visual design and, and how that's going to work. And I think good architects and good liturgical designers and good organ builders do and know how to work together as an ensemble to make this work out right for the parish. Um, you don't want the organ looking like Picasso designed it and the building looking like Frank Lloyd Wright designed it and, <laughs> and the front of the place looking like George Washington designed it. Uh, you need coordination. So they do need to work together the good news, which I hope I expressed in this webinar today, is that there is a lot of visual option and opportunity in terms of pipe organs. So if you get good minds and cooperative folks working together, I think the result can be excellent. I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> yes. Um, we also have another question uh, regarding uh, air handling systems for pipe or electronic organs and any concerns or uh, potential issues that that might arise and how those are best handled? Sure. Well, the, the climate will a, a affect a pipe organ quite a bit, uh, not so much for digital electronic organs. So let's talk about pipe organs first. Temperature is the first thing to be concerned about. Um, it, a pipe organ will sound in tune within about five degrees up and down of the temperature it was tuned at. So if the organ's tuned at 68 degrees, it'll sound in tune at 68, plus five degrees, minus five degrees. If the temperature deviates past that, it's gonna to start to sound out of tune. It's because the density of the air and the expansion and contraction of materials will start to be affected by changing temperature. So tune at 68, Turn off the furnace, let the room get cold, the organ will be out of tune. The good news is when you bring the room back to 68, turn up the furnace next weekend for mass, the organ will be back in tune. So number one, consistent temperature while you're listening to the organ. You don't need temperature consistent 365 days a year, but you have to bring the organ back to tuning temperature during a service or a concert when you want to hear it. So a way to keep temperature consistent and always get it back. You just need good airflow and circulation through a chamber so that the chamber doesn't get too hot or too cold and difficult to get the temperature right. Get back to tuning temperature you're in tune. The other climate issue is that of humidity. If the organ is allowed to be in a dry, hot temperature situation for too long, it'll get damaged. The leathers will have shorter life because they'll dry out. Wood has the potential to crack and organ builders do build instruments to combat these things with resilient um, gaskets and spring loaded screws and so forth. But still one should take care that the organ environment does not get too dry or hot, especially in the winter, um, such that wood and leather can be damaged. So keeping humidity levels not lower than 30% for ex extended periods of time is important. The organ really doesn't matter how humid it gets in the summer. It's just not too dry in the winter is important. We also have a question, Scott, about how often a pipe organ needs maintenance and, and at what level. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, is yearly cleaning required? Is yearly tuning required? Is there five-year periods where different things need to happen to the organ? Sure. <clears throat> well, all of that's a big open question. <laughs> um, tuning, let's take that first. Uh, as I just described, if you tune at a particular temperature, deviate from that temperature, and then return to that temperature, the organ will be back in tune. Well, that works so far. The more you deviate the organ's temperature back and forth and back and forth, it will start to need tuning after a while or retuning because just that mechanical shift of material expansion and contraction will sort of get the best of you. So in many cases, an organ might need a tuning once a year just to establish it. 
um, it might need a touch up tuning in the other seasons. So let's say it has its main tuning around Easter time when the climate is warming up. It might need a touch up tuning at Christmas time when now we're in furnace mode instead of air conditioning mode. Um, so it's not untypical for an organ to need a general tuning once a year, a touch up a second time a year. Um, if temperatures and humidity are more stable, it can go longer. We have some instruments right in the Milwaukee area here that haven't been tuned for about 10 or 15 years because their buildings are uh, humidity controlled and the temperature isn't deviating terribly much. Uh, so other than tuning, there's not too much that can go wrong with an organ. If an organ has leather parts, some do, some don't, depending on the kind of mechanism. But if an organ has leather parts, over time that leather will start to decay. Um, higher humidity will make that leather last longer. But often at the point of about 60, 75 years or so, uh, an organ will likely need to be re-leathered. And that's just a process of taking out the leather valves or pouches that are in there or bellows, gussets, whatever, and replacing those. So that's a 60, 75 year maintenance item. Uh, we don't need cleaning too often, especially in modern buildings where the HVAC systems are generally pretty good. Um, an organ certainly doesn't need cleaning every year. Well, generally, we look at maybe 20 years or so for a cleaning, and that might be a light vacuuming, and then a real good cleaning at the 60, 70 year point when the leathers go. So there's ongoing tuning, there's some maintenance needed and replacement of leathers if an organ has leather, and there's cleaning. Other than that, oiling the blower, and you're kind of set to go. So Scott, and we have another question regarding a, a church that might be in the process of restoration and there is an existing pipe organ, but uh, it can't be afforded to maintain at the current time. What would be the recommendations or the potentials for either storing the instrument or keeping the instrument um, in, in some state of, of uh, not deterioration okay. while you're waiting to make uh, organ music back as a uh, active part of the liturgy. Oh, sure. Um, well, what I would not recommend is dismantling it and moving it to storage somewhere. Um, if organ pipes are left in crates and boxes or laying on their side and not upright in their position on the wind chest for too long, they can start to collapse and go out of round, things like that. So the organ is best just left where it is assembled together and not dismantled and stored elsewhere. Um, when the organ is assembled in its original location, ideally that is the best way to have access to it because if it's properly designed in the first place, it ought to have passage boards and access ways and panels to get into things. So when it is time to do a restoration or a repair job on the instrument, it's easily accessible if it's together. Again, if it's in parts and boxes and crates in a warehouse, it's hard to get to things. So I would really recommend just leave it be. Um, if there's a dust or dirt problem going to happen, I would cover the tone openings with a plastic um, so that you don't have more dust or dirt if you do another remodeling in a building. Um, I wouldn't cut any cables. If, if there's electricity concerns, maybe disconnect at a circuit board or in a fuse box or something. Um, but I would pretty much leave it be. Don't let anyone in to monkey with it. <laughs> don't get it dirty. Don't mess with it. If it's just left alone until you have funds or time to address its restoration or repair, it's probably the best. Great. So um, as a planning team or a building committee were to undertake uh, the design or the renovation of a worship space and they needed to find uh, either an organ builder or an organ consultant that could help them with recommendations, how, how would they go about that process of finding them? 
the professional? Sure. Well, uh, in the webinar here, I gave the uh, contact for the Associated Pipe Organ Builders and the American Institute of Organ Builders. Both of those are professional organizations with certain criteria for membership. So you're, you're dealing with vetted um, and uh, qualified uh, organ companies that would be members of those organizations. And so if you're looking for an organ builder, I would at least start with what brand of organ do you have already if you're looking at maintaining or fixing one you have. If that organ company is still in business, I would start there. I would go to one of these organ building organizations I mentioned for um, uh, advice. Uh, the American Guild of Organists also is an organization with resources. Uh, you may wish to check and see if there's a uh, professional music school somewhere near the church. If, if a university has an organ or a church music program or organ professor, that would be a place to go. Great. One of our members has asked, uh, uh, has expressed that it was an excellent presentation and asked if it's possible to receive a copy of the PowerPoint and to have some indication of which churches were depicted in the presentation. Oh, sure. Um, she's indicated that it would help our building committee uh, when making decisions. And um, possibly uh, I'll remind members and attendees that uh, the presentation itself will be posted on the website, uh, the ACLS website in uh, three months. I'm thinking that possibly the best way to address that would be to uh, give contact information uh, now that uh, that Simone could contact you, get a copy of maybe some of the images and sure, um, and a list of what they are. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly you have a, a website or a phone number <laughs> that you get could be reached to sure. get that information. Yeah, I can give you my phone number now if you'd like. Our office number is four one four seven seven one eight nine six six, and if you call me there, we can work out a contact point to get a list of the uh, images and buildings and organs that they are. And I think if you Google uh, Rydell and Associates, R-I-E-D-E-L, uh, you'll also get uh, contact information as well. Right. The website is www.riddellassociates.com. Great. That is very likely all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank again our presenter, Scott Rydell for a great presentation.